We can just. Uh, hi, I'm John Carruthers, and this is that Mental Ginger Show. All right, trip. <laughs> This episode of That Mental Ginger Show is recorded at Scuff Studios. If you're looking to do podcasts, music, or any creative passions, these guys will have you covered. For more information, contact Scuff Studios at scuffed.studios.gla at gmail.com or find them on Facebook or Instagram and drop them a message. Scuff Studios, to nurture your creative passions. John, thank you so much for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it, man. Like it's, I always like getting comedians because you never find that they're going to turn down a gig. No, no, you're absolutely right. It's just it's like, 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 are you free to? Yes, I didn't even say what it is. I don't care. I'm, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> don't even know what data is, <laughs> but but I'll be there. Yeah. But well, uh, and one of the things that I'll say right away is I want to personally thank you for. Uh, letting me come on your Friday 6pm show. Anytime. Because it was just after I'd had a really bad experience with a or and my confidence was knocked and I had quite a few cancellations yep. of gigs and I didn't want to, to do it again. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm, I, I don't think it's going to go well. You might get a, ba- you get, get a bad reputation with the stuff that you, you might hear and you're like, I'm no cancelling you. Yeah. Well, we'll just, well, we'll delay it this week and come back on next week. What and trust me, you'll be better. What and I did that, and you were so supportive, man. So I really appreciate it. Any time, oh, not any time. Obviously, it needs to be Friday and at six p.m. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I see you've been but, doing a. What is it? A ten p.m. one now? Tuesday, ten p.m. Uh, I've been doing. I've been doing a kind of streaming uh, thing. It's usually about half past seven on a on a Tuesday. Yeah, and it's me and a, a, another comedian, an ex comedian, ah. Chris Ashworth. He, he, he's he's maybe considering getting back, but. Uh, uh, obviously, he didn't hear that from me because he told me to keep it under. Well, just so we could always, just edit that bit out. <laughs> we always love a ginger exclusive yep. here. Like, if he has planned and come back on, right, then get yourself on this show and get yourself some publicity, Absolutely. mate. Absolutely. But we're doing really well in Russia, so I'm on the war. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, I joke, of course. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're, do, we're doing a we're doing a kind of stream. It's usually half past seven on, on a Tuesday, and it's I don't know if you remember the old kind of fighting fantasy style game yeah. books from the eighties. So I'm basically reading them out to them and making him make choices. It's just it's <laughs> just to just to get drunk, basically. Yeah. Uh, but it's 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 good fun. Uh, we yeah. usually we usually do about five five minutes of honest to god questing in the ninety minutes that we that we're running. <laughs> And I refuse to, I refuse to, it's called Tight 10 on Titan, because yeah. the whole joke is that the, the fantasy world and fine fantasy is called Titan, mm-hmm. that was the world, and Tight 10 something you're supposed to be able to do as a comedian, you know, you're not supposed yeah. to do 9, you're not supposed to do 11, and then I waffle on for 90 minutes, so that sounds about right. it's ironic. That was like the first gig that I'd, uh, that I'd done on stage, what, uh, the comedy gig, and it was like, it got to be uh, 5 minutes, it was 10. Yeah. What, and it was because I wasn't expecting anybody to laugh. And people laugh. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I, I was like, I was going, do you realize you guys laugh and eat up my time? <laughs> well, and and uh, the person that was organizing it's going to be pissed. <laughs> <laughs> well, my problem is that I pencil in laughs and they don't come. So usually I run a bit short. Yeah. Well, in fairness, like, uh, I think it's, it's, you don't give yourself enough credit with that one, man. Oh, and that actually leads me to the first question. So uh, what I like to do is I like to get my guests to tell me about their origin stories. Because right, the one okay. thing we've all got in common is that we all have an or- origins. So, for my faithful followers, John, please, tell us your origin story. My origin story in terms of, of right. comedy. We start with the basics. Where were you born? I was born in Glasgow. Hey, was that in the Royal or was it in the Southern? It or? was uh, York Hill. Ah, oh, brilliant. A York Hill baby. Yeah, a York Hill baby. <laughs> my kids have had this, well, Kieran had to spend a couple of uh, trips in York Hill. Like he had, uh, he had uh, hernias. Oh, right, okay. Like when he was young, so what, when he was one, he got taken in for an emergency one, and then he got taken in again. Oh, gosh. Because what, um, it basically reformed again. Yeah. What, he, he's had more hair, he's had more operations in his short life than I've had in my entire life. Yeah, it's no, crazy. that's crazy. Well, I mean, it's well, such a young age, you know? I know. Well, in a way, I'm glad because it means he won't remember it. Yeah. Like, he'll just, he just has these wee two puncture wounds in his tummy, and he'll just be like, what are they for? I'll just be like, yeah, that's when we used to just blow you up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you're running a bit flat instead of feeding you we just went Dink. Yeah. <laughs> my that daughter... looks so wrong on camera I apologise <laughs> my daughter spent uh, the first six weeks of her life in York Hill 
Oh, well, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Was she <laughs> premature? Or? Uh, she was a bit premature. There's more to it. She's adopted, so she, ah. so her birth mum had some some issues. Yeah. But, but, you know, we'll get her in for a podcast. I won't, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want her to steal my thunder, basically. <laughs> uh, so we'll get her in one day and she can tell you well, all about it. The daughter or the mum? <laughs> uh, the, the mother had some issues, uh, uh, which then led to issues in uh, the daughter. So. No, that's, that's all right. Uh, mm. My kids were preemies as well. They were 10 weeks premature. All oh, right, okay. That's they, spent, yeah. they spent six weeks in the uh, neonate at Wisha. Well, they did absolutely, they did brilliant. My yeah. in fairness, like I've got to say. Right, so, yeah, how do you go about, like, adoption like in a way how, did that how long have you got uh don't know how long, we got, how long have we got, right? uh, <laughs> so uh well i mean well obviously you know try to try to uh do it the conventional way get the practice uh, in, we've got course. the practice in. you know we, yeah. were, we were we were obviously naturally tried for children sometimes twice three times a day uh and and it just wasn't happening mm. maybe i was doing it wrong i don't know and first i'm quite envious because like, uh, when we said we were going to try for a kid and i specified one and then i got yep. to but, yeah. uh, what we we thought it wouldn't happen because Alison had a miscarriage previously. Uh, I'd been kicked in the crotch so many times in my life. I thought that I barely had anything down there yeah. to work with. Yeah. Well, and in the space of four months, she's pregnant with twins, and I'm like, I didn't realize this was a perverted weight training. <laughs> what that you guys have been doing like, for all these years, just going bump like my my sperm or like Sylvester Stallone. They were just they were just desperate to escape by any means necessary. It was just necessary. like it was just like get to the ovary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was unreal. Well, so when I used to say, well, uh, my dad used to say it made the splitter in half. He didn't mean the embryo. <laughs> well, it's factually true because they're identical twins and that's Excellent. how it happens. Cool. So yeah, you, you tell all the ones in the audience that are smart when I draw a joke because they'll go ah, and laugh and the other ones just go, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so. But I've, got, I've, I've, ado I've adopted two children. Uh, that's brilliant. Still why I bandy words like hero around, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the Enrique Iglesias of Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, so one, my daughter's fourteen. My daughter, my, my daughter, my daughter's fourteen. My daughter's still fourteen. I'll mention the other one now. My son, he's seven. Oh, so it's right. quite a significant. Just because that is quite a laborious process. Yeah, it does take a wee while. That's in between them, so. paperwork. Lots paperwork. of paperwork. You have to obviously. Uh, well, there, there's. Pr it's probably more difficult to adopt a child as you would expect than it would be to naturally conceive one, apart from people like me that can't. Mm. But, uh, but you know, they, they, they need to make, I mean, these children have got a really kind of difficult start in their life, yeah. potentially, uh, obviously to varying degrees. Mm. Uh, although the, the story behind that is we, when we were looking to adopt a second child, we were told there's no such thing as a, as a perfect child. You know, this child's going to have issues yeah and of course the second child's like the difficult second album sort of thing uh -huh. you just need to make sure that it also ties in with you know with make sure that it doesn't album. have an impact in the, the the first child in any way shape yeah. or form and that goes both ways so yeah. we're told there, there's there's no perfect child a child doesn't just it's not like the 1950s where like some well-to-do women got got uh up the duff from the gardener and they yeah. just kind of it's a secret and they just send them somewhere else uh yeah. so we were we were told that and then uh we we got a second child that actually fit that criteria. Someone, oh, someone just gave the, the the child up for adoption. Was was very young, and uh, in my eyes, was mature enough to realise that she wasn't mature enough to. Yeah. So, so, so she was she was underage. She was already in care, and she, so, so we got. I mean, there was a lot of fundamental issues mm -hmm. involved in uh, my, my my daughter's birth, etc. Again, we were lucky enough; she was taken right into care immediately, yeah. just because unfortunately she had an older kind of birth brother who mm. had flagged up certain things with social services. So she was taking an assignment of care, which is obviously tragic for the family, but at the same time, she got a better start in life than she yeah. might have. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I, I've, I've gone off on a tangent hey, as One as of the I things do. that I, I encourage on this show is tangents. Right, yeah, okay, good. That makes it more natural for Good, me. So good, you've got, picked the right person. Yeah, and I'll uh, also ask very inappropriate questions. So cool. here goes. Well, is it you or your missus that, that had the... The issue. It was me. It was you. Well, yep. is it, uh, was it low count? Uh, well, what actually happened was, um, I just uh, well, it wasn't happening, and then uh, I, I noticed a lump in my my testicle, wow. which obviously got checked out yeah. uh, after like just going up to uh, random work colleagues saying, "Can you feel something?" and and well, just this look funny. To you. Does this that, that doesn't look right? Does it? So like, there shouldn't be three down yeah, there, absolutely. right? <laughs> so, so we found a lump and we were a bit worried. Yeah. Uh, obviously, went checked in and said it's nothing to worry about. And it was actually a thing called a varicocele, right. which so, is like a varicose vein. Yeah. Uh, 
in your, you know, in right. the testicular in the uh, area. Region. Yep, yep. Yeah. And one of the side effects of that is that it kind of superheats uh, your your testicles and wow. basically boils your sperm. So, you which explains the burning sensations so, I used to get as a teenager. Well, at least it's not going there, yeah. Absolutely, that's right? that. Uh, so, so you've got ex so basically you can see because you've got extra warm balls. I've got extra warm balls. Right, uh, so, so we could hook you up to the gas meter, well, and you could heat you could heat my house for me. Well, well, mm. yes, possibly. Well, and just, imagine that, like just like for the visual of me strapping John Carruthers to my boiler, <laughs> well, and just being like, right, Alison, good news. We do not need to pay for lecky or gas for the next six months. Bad news is we've got a a permanent lodger absolutely <laughs> and you just need to you just need to keep the engine running as well uh, that, uh, that's that, uh, that makes the jokes that, uh, that I made my stand up set about saying you know being a professional wanker and turning your room into a masturbation furnace really bad absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so uh, oh, but obviously they've, they, they're, they're, they're stuff they can do there's stuff they can do uh, for this and I got yeah. this keyhole surgery ah, which right. basically involves uh, sending a kind of copper wire down and then uh, embolizing it so that it kind of springs up and it ties the vein off. All right. So that was quite cool. Uh, so we decided well, to... We that was quite cool. That was quite... Get, get your balls unheated. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite good. The, the, the nurse as well, you know, you're there and it's actually a local, it's a local anesthetic. So oh, you're so there. You awake for the whole I was, thing? I was awake for the whole thing. And they oh, actually think, it, they, they think it's quite good as well to show you what's happening on the screen so that you're not freaked out, which, spoiler alert, isn't the case? Yeah, I, yep. I would freak yep. you out even yep. more to look at your own boss getting yep. operated. Absolutely. On. So the the, uh, the nurse, the, you always knew something bad was coming up because the nurse would go, "So John, uh, what kind of music are you into?" Well, I really like. Uh, yeah. uh, Every guy watch this will have crossed their legs. Absolutely. Well, and I'm just looking to see now. None of the guys in the studio have crossed their legs just no, yet, yeah. so we can go into more detail. Excellent. So I want to see who's going to cross their legs first. There's there's there's, yeah. there's 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 more to it. There's more to it because uh Six months later, it represented because you've got wow. you've got loads of veins that kind of aren't used, and then yeah. it just found somewhere else, and the varicose vein represented. And at this point, we had been told that there was a good chance that this was the reason that we couldn't conceive. Right. So I decided to go a bit hardcore and say, say, well, we'll do it again. And said, well, I mean, it's just, you know, we can't do it again. We need to strip the vein out. Oh. So I decided to to strip the vein right. out, and it's no cross legs just yet. yet. <laughs> and they did say to me, they said, are you sure you want to do this? And I went, why the fuck not? <laughs> You're like, what else can you uh, do? Absolutely. Me? Why yeah. not? Why not? Why not do this? Uh, am I allowed to swear? Sorry. I encourage it. Right, okay, excellent. Talking, sorry, I just... You're, you're talking about this. Yeah, no, it's just... Swearing is more than encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I said, it's not a local one, this one. Surely I went, no, I don't worry, it's a general. And then, uh, so I'm going down there. And, uh, so, How did you get knocked out for this I got knocked out for this one. And the last thing I remember, and I don't know how much of this is a kind of fever dream, because obviously the, the drug you, was the, the doctor telling me that because of the keyhole procedure and the fact that it very rarely represents, it's very unlikely that this will represent, there's like a... 0.5% chance that it will represent. Yeah. Uh, he said, oh, I've not done one of these in years, and then, boom, <laughs> unconscious. <laughs> uh, so, so. Uh, that's, like, that's like, yeah, the stories that you hear where someone's getting knocked out and they go, right, it was a colonoscopy, actually. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> was it the left leg or the right leg? Uh, <laughs> So so uh so that's that that's it this is where it gets this is where it gets interesting. It hurt a lot and yeah. I was off work I was off I was off work for a while. Uh and and it did hurt, uh as as you would expect. Yeah. And um then I discovered that there was still a lot of pain there and it just uh, it turns out that it caused a bit of nerve damage. Oh bloody hell. So yeah, so that's fun. That's so the, the three strikes rule really hit you. The three you. strikes well, well, actually bit, hit you in the balls. You're about to get the fourth strike. Oh man. On account of the fact that uh no, no cross legs yet. The varicose vein represented itself. Fuck you. What? <laughs> Your varicose vein is like the Terminator. <laughs> well, this yeah. is the thing because I then get weaked to the, the Golden Jubilee hospital, I think it was, yeah. because the only way uh, a varicose vein should represent itself three times in that area is if uh, your liver's about to fail. Holy shit. And they just went, ah, well, this isn't right because, you know, it's usually like a kind of warning sign if yeah. varicose veins continue to represent that there might be something like, like you're about to kind of... So they went and I got ultrasounds and they went, nope, absolutely fine. So I'm a, I'm a genetic anomaly. Wow. Despite my best, dis despite my best kind of attempts, my liver's still fully functioning. Yeah. Uh, and and I just gave up at that point. I just went, I'm not doing this again. They actually, they actually told me that if they tried, they would have to remove the uh, the left testicle. Wow. I just went. It is a good talking point. It would be really yeah. good for the comedy. 
Oh. But at, at what stage do you just kind of go, ah, do you know what? I'm just. Yeah, because so, you could make jokes of like, you know, like what side do you lean in? Eh? I know, I know. You know, I, 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 you know what? I'm constantly leaning to one side. It's because I'm a bit off center. Yep. Like, I can just go, like, you know, see if we're down there anyway and it doesn't look like I'm reproducing. Let's just make sure that I can get the vasectomy. Get it, well. absolutely. Yeah, well. Just go the whole hog. We we yeah. we still kind of because it's not impossible. It wasn't impossible that I couldn't conceive, but you know my so so we just decided we'll do we'll, we'll just keep trying. And actually, do you know this is the thing as well? When you actually adopt, yeah. you actually have to sign something saying that uh, you're you're not going to attempt to naturally have a child for a period of time. Yeah, how's that? Uh, yeah, they basically uh, encourage you to start using protection. Nice. Yep. Protection or anal, that was your choices. <laughs> uh, oh, no, one, uh, one would be picked. I know, yeah. absolutely. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, yeah, we went for protection as well. So why, uh, why did they, do you know why that they, they, you had to basically sign a consent form saying, no, nah, we're a Johnny? Uh, we, we have to sign a consent form because obviously, you you know, you're trying to bring, uh, you're trying to bring a, a, mem a new member of your family in. Yeah. And if you then suddenly, and this, this is a big problem, is the fact that a lot of the kind of reasons that some people can't conceive, even though there's obviously a physical reason for it, sometimes there's 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 a kind of mental side to it as well, and that uh, you know you're just there's there's a tension that has an impact on your your body, so etc. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So so if you suddenly you've got a child, and then suddenly the pressure's off a little bit, yeah, and then. They, they obviously don't take into consideration that the ultimate kind of birth control you can have is having children around anyway. So, yeah. I mean, that, that kind of put paid to anyway. That, so. that is one of the be uh, best versions of birth control. Absolutely. So, uh, just having what they uh, like, no, I do not want to risk them walking in but, and then having to explain this before they're ready. That's the school's job. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, that was the case with me. I went in sex ed in second year of high school and I was just like, I don't want to ask my parents any questions yeah. about this. So, I just walked in and went, Yep, that they've done sex education with me. I don't have any questions. Get off the hook. Yeah, absolutely. Move that. on. Move on. Well, it didn't help when he found the porn mags under my bed, mind. Uh, but the only question he asked was, is it the girls or the guys? <laughs> this was a not so enlightened time, my friends. <laughs> so I said, it's the, it's the girls. It's the girls. But I just went, thank fuck for that. <laughs> and off he went. But was, what, the thing that pissed me off the most was when he said, I found this under your bed. It would bang smack in the center of my yep. head. You could not get there unless you went down there with yeah. a fucking diver's helmet. Well, they knew where he looked. Did, he went to look deliberately yeah. to just check out the quality of the merchandise. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was sick of going through his own back catalogue and he yeah. wondered if you could bring anything new to the I table. I didn't find the video with the 40 lesbians gang banging in a ring. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also the title of that video. Which was also hosted by Nasty yeah. Nick for Big Brother. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Yes. That's the worst part. I cannot remember anything about that porno save for the fact that it was hosted by Nasty Nick for Big Brother. Okay. That shows you how much of an impact that has in my life. <laughs> it just shows you that it's, yeah, you can swear you can talk about anything on here. Excellent. I have no filter. My, uh, it's best to get all my airs out before Twitter tries to cancel me. Absolutely. But Job done. Just it won't on. be long. It won't be long. You... Well, they've tried to cancel me on here so many times, but I'm like the ginger quip, uh, equivalent of hairpiece. I just keep coming back. <laughs> well, I just come back bigger and stronger. You're, you're like my Varicacil. Yeah, essentially, yep. I'm, I am your Varicacil. Yep. I can, that could be the, that needs to be the title for the show, the Varicacil. The Varicacil show. This yeah, is... so I'll need you to give me like the proper spelling for it so I don't arse that up because I arsed up like the spelling of the University of Berkeley and the guy was like, yeah, uh, this is how it's spelled. I'm like, oh, yeah, I was like, what? Sorry, guys. Yeah, I'll leave the proper spelling. Just say ball ache. It's yeah. easier. What? What? This entire show's tagline could be "It's a ball ache." It's a ball ache. <laughs> so that that that's why they they they're, they're, they're uh, they don't mention the fact that usually uh one in five adoptions actually fail at some point. Really? Uh, they don't tell you that when you go into it. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and when I say fail, I mean you know I don't mean instantly take the child back, but there's a kind of breakdown uh and. Yeah either family dynamic because the husband and wife decide, you know, whatever, or, you know, the, the child just asks to go or, or you know, so there's more yeah. to it than just, it's not a kind of take this child back sort of thing, but there's a, there's a so, so they like don't. A probationary period? Like there, there, there technically is a probationary period in that you don't get the child and then you, you, you for about six months or so, you're almost long-term fostering yeah. until you get a court date. Yeah. And then when they find you not guilty, they give you the child. Ah, right. So yeah, so 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 I the, thought it would be guilty. Guilty, no, absolutely. Yeah. This sentence you to <laughs> sentence you looking after a child. So so they, they they want you to be sure that because the absolute worst thing for the child in care yeah. would be if suddenly mum becomes pregnant. Yeah. And then uh there's almost 
and I don't think anyone would do it on purpose, but you would subconsciously at that point probably say, well, this is my child. And, and yeah. you know, with the best will in the world, you would almost like suddenly have this kind of imposter yeah. Um, uh, in, in your house when you so when you realize so you can... they worry about like right, that your like your biological child will get all the attention you yeah. easily just putting the other kid in the garage yep. yeah. and just leaving it there I mean obviously there's some families that, that have children naturally and then yeah. go on to adopt children themselves but that's yeah. a slightly different dynamic and that's more of a kind of family decision sort of thing yeah. But uh, from from the perspective of you know you 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 get this child in your house and it's like yeah. you're everything and then suddenly you're yeah. pregnant and it can kind of mess up yeah. certain things. But I wonder how that is if it's uh, like if it's step kids because uh, my brother's uh, my brother has uh, three kids too. Yep. What are uh, from his now wife? What from a previous marriage? Yep. He's got one of his own. But he doesn't treat me any different. I think his exact words were, "They're all assholes." Yeah, no, no. But uh, I mean, so it's like, it's like, and they take to, they take to him as a dad, but he takes to them as his, what, his own kids. But like, he's had them around so on. I want, but maybe there should be something like that for step kids as well. Yeah, like, you know, essentially like a. In my, in my head, there should be like a court proceeding of like, you know, are you definitely sure you're going to take the hit? Yeah. Why well, and make sure it's signed off on because there could be so many things where our relationship breaks down in that. Child from that as well. yeah, that, that, that's a tough one and uh, you're you're almost there, there, there's people in there already and it's kind of well yeah. you know you've got the kind of wicked stepmother type thing sort yeah. of thing so so you've got that it, it, it's more le there, there's more legal repercussions uh with adoption obviously you know as well i've watched a lot of stepmom videos online and they, they yeah. seem to go on quite well with the stepkids uh, yeah. uh always there always seems to be that i'm more what i think about did they finally eat the pizza? <laughs> it's like, how much did it, did it cost to fix that sink? <laughs> well, was her hand really stuck? Yeah. And that washing uh, machine. Uh, did, did she did she really need help with uh, sorting out that exercise machine? <laughs> well, we, it was definitely there's some sort of cross training going on there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Right, so tangents, it, so, tangents, are tangents. Well, so. I love the tangents on this show. <laughs> you, know, you think you're going to talk about mental health, and all of a sudden you're talking about a guy's veins and his balls and adoption. It did have quite an impact on my mental health. I'm not going to lie yeah. to you. Well, that was the question I was yeah. going to ask. Like, yeah. how, what well, before you decide to adopt and stuff, like having those kind of issues, like, well, obviously you would have been naturally like upset. And yeah. Down, like, how, how big an impact did that have on your mental health? Do you know the actual fact that I couldn't uh, conceive didn't have any real impact on mental health? Uh, it was the 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 fact that uh, as a consequence of the operation, which which you know uh, this happened in two thousand and seven. That both operations happened in two thousand and seven. Once uh, early on two thousand and seven, the second one kind of later on. So it's it's a fair while ago. Yeah. But it's the fact that you know because of the nerve damage, there was a fair amount of chronic pain. Yeah. Uh, which was obviously treated with medication and stuff. But I remember but, but one of the things, my daughter, when my, when my daughter arrived, there was a point where my daughter kind of came running at me yeah. and hit me squarely oh. and, and, I, and I passed out. Yikes. Yep. Uh, my, 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 wife, who was, my wife who was in the kitchen heard a thud, yeah. thought nothing of it, and then came in what we, we worked out later on was probably about 15 minutes later and I was lying. So you were left lying? I was left lying and conscious. Hour quarter of an hour while my daughter was just sitting kind of leafing through a book that she couldn't read probably the best night's sleep you'd had absolutely that's it oh no for sure yeah. uh because it's a scary thing when it happens because my wife's got um chronic back pain what well, and two days after we got married she took a really bad seizure on her back yeah what well, and it caused her to to pass out yep. she was like like going red foaming at the mouth and all that kind of shit. i genuinely thought two days in my marriage and i fucking killed my wife what well, it was terrifying well, of course, like, what, eh, all the guys made the jokes of two days after you're married and our back gives out. Absolutely, yeah. that's it. Well done. It's well like, done. Like, I was like, I am neither confirming nor denying nor de <laughs> well, that it has anything to do with it. And I was just like, fucking nothing to do with it. <laughs> it wasn't even in the room. I was like, he wasn't uh, there when it happened. Then who was the milkman? <laughs> that joke used to work really well. I used to say my, uh, my kids would probably got uh, knocked up by the milkman. And then we got a fucking milkman. Yeah. And that, oh. was, that was like, Okay, I'm really panicking now. <laughs> Delivering pints of white liquid to the door. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah well, I, I noticed that those, those bottles were a bit geez, smaller than normal. Go, this is a bit warm. It's like, it's like why, why uh, are they coming in an actimal? <laughs> 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 well, is that that El Casai immunity test? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, dad, my dad used to say to me uh, that, that I wasn't his and 
that I was a milkman's. And one day I called him on it and said, Dad, I'm, I'm your spitting image. I'm your yeah. spitting image. He's like, no, oh, no mind, you're no mind, you're the milkman's. I went, Dad, look, it's like looking at a, it's like looking at an elderly mirror. <laughs> uh, I said, there's no way, there's no way that we are not related. And then without like a pause, my dad just went, milkman was my brother. Oh, <laughs> nice one. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. Is that in case you're wondering, like, the guys in the corner are standing <laughs> up right now? It's really annoying. It's like, I think Hilly's going to have an aneurysm. It's, it's, it's really annoying. It's really annoying. You're a comedian. Your dad was funnier than you are. Uh, I, I wouldn't say so, man. Yeah. You're a good comedian. <laughs> it's like, in fairness, like, my, my dad still says to me and my brother are adopted. But when I was eight and he said that, I, I turned around and I went, does that mean I get to keep my hair? <laughs> he was not happy, not happy at that. Yeah. I got chased with Tokyo. Yep. <laughs> well, it's really weird. Again, you're talking earlier around about kind of generational stuff, and your yeah. dad was worried about you know who you were looking at in these kind of yeah. magazines and stuff. Uh, my mum used to, whenever my mum was annoyed with me, if she was pissed off, she used to say, "You're adopted." So she used to actually, and that was a kind of insult. Yeah. Which now, in hindsight, she's probably kind of going, "Oh shit," because now I've adopted yeah, two kids, and she's just kind of. Yeah, your mom's probably thinking, did I jinx his spirit? Absolutely. Or, or she's worried that, you know, she used that as a slight. And yeah. then suddenly, you know, we're in a situation where, where I've, I've kind of... And obviously I use that as a slight on my children and other things. It just means that, uh, like, you know, yep. she's got egg on her face for the rest of her life. Absolutely. Which which I, I heartily recommend. It's yeah, good it's good, it's good getting your, it's, your parents in the back foot. Yeah, it's like how, uh, like... Uh, we had twins and, like, and there was no twins on my side of the family like, and there was twins on Alison's side but I don't think it's a direct blood link like, and I blamed my brother for it not for those reasons <laughs> like, but for years like he used to say to me no one you're lucky Andy you'll knock up some bird and it'll be twins, twins. <laughs> like, so I'm like you owe me four and a half years child payment you bastard absolutely <laughs> jinxed jinxed I had I had friends that, that, that had a child and then decided, you know, they always wanted two kids and they just went, do you know what, we'll, we'll, we'll have a second one. And then the second lot were twins and they were just like, oh. Yeah. Well, I've, he I've heard that quite a lot. Yeah. Um, my therapist, ironically, uh, it, was, it was her that had, that was the thing that happened to her. She had one and then she had two in the bounce. Yeah. Well, and she was like, well, yikes. They, they, they actually, uh, they, they don't like you to bounce them. No, no, uh, that's the hard way. Sorry, that's, that's, <laughs> what I, Again, that's, we finally got to the reason why my, my daughter was put into care. Uh, I'm glad that anyone to come right out and say it. I'm glad, I'm glad that it managed to come yeah. up in quite a fluid manner. Like, we also got to the reason why I was removed from my kids for some <laughs> <laughs> well, Oh, man. But, so tell me about, what got you into stand-up comedy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, right. shit, that's that's a rubbish answer, isn't it? Uh, I had to do my I had to do my groom speech when I got married, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I had a pal a pal Davy who was constantly saying you should do comedy, you should do comedy. And I said there's a big difference between kind of being you know making jokes in the pub and actually going up and kind of doing stand up. Yeah. And then when I when I did the kind of you know my wife and I would like to thank blah blah blah. Yeah. And obviously I, I was standing in front of everyone and I made a bit of a kind of showmanship of it yeah. and uh, my pal Davey and his worst enemy who also happened to be one of my pals yeah. Stevie uh, the two of them kind of came up to me and they said we don't like each other and we've just spent the last half hour saying that you should do comedy <laughs> and then I was like all right okay so uh, I decided that after my honeymoon I would go and do an open mic gig yeah and there was a there was a comedy club in the south side of Glasgow at the time called yeah. The Vault yeah. Uh, and they, so they did comedy and they, they, they advertised this open mic night on a Tuesday. And I went, well, I'll get down there and I'll do it. And I, I tried to write some stuff, realised I'm terrible yeah. at writing stuff. But went anyway, went down, got there, I was dead excited, went in and just said, I'm here for the open mic night. And, and then it suddenly transpired that uh, even though it was a comedy club, it was a music open mic night. Oh, so right. loads of people can down. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, no, no real training there. Yeah. Uh, and guitar, but as you can see, I really know my stuff. Ah, uh, definitely. Uh, just yeah. So they were, they were, they were, they were doing, and and, I, and then the 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 woman behind the bar said, "She just get up anyway." Yeah. And I went, "No, <laughs> I should just do it anyway." Uh, and even though I'd just been married for uh, about a month or so, uh, I felt like she was flirting with me, and I decided to try and impress her. But she was probably, uh, you know, considering I was there with my wife, was probably the wrong move. But, uh, but, but, so I got up anyway and I actually did it and I loved it. Yeah. Uh, and then I went the week after to the open mic night uh, again, even though it was just music. 
and I did it again. Yeah. And then thought, I'm going to keep doing this. And then uh, that was the last time I went. Uh, so clearly that didn't happen. <laughs> and then I did the usual route that people do in Glasgow. I, I, I decided to sign up for uh, Red Raw oh, nice. at the stand. And then they said that will take... Back then, I mean, that was 2005. Back then, it was like a bit of a faster turnaround than you've yeah. got now, but it was still taking a while. And in the meantime, I found other little pubs that were doing kind of old night nights. Yeah. I did it, I did it, I did it. Uh, and then, of course, weirdly enough, the, the you know, the, the try and IVF sort yeah. of thing uh, kicked in and then the adoption process. And then I thought, well, you know, comedy at that point to me was quite stressful. And yeah. so was this sudden process that we're going through. So yeah, I decided yeah. I had to choose one. Mm -hmm. So I made my choice. And then my wife managed to convince me to change my choice back to adoption. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so we did that. And then I just kind of dropped it. So I dropped the, I dropped the comedy for ages and ages and ages. Uh, so I stopped doing comedy kind of probably about, so I did it from like 2005 to 2006. Yeah. Not consistently, you know, back back in the day, old night nights, I was maybe lucky if I was getting out gigging once every couple of months, really. You know, I was I wasn't really serious about it. I was just having a bite of laugh. I was serious in that I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna become a star, mm -hmm. uh, but not serious enough to actually be bothered going out and looking for it. Yeah. Uh so I, I've approached when I'm when I decided to come back to comedy, I've approached it slightly differently. I just want to do it for a laugh now, sort of thing. Yeah. But uh so uh what got me back into it was obviously, you know. Uh, once my daughter was uh, here and we were looking at it and it was just, things were a lot easier. And then my dad, my dad actually uh, got uh, bowel cancer. And uh, I just spoke to spoke to my wife one night and said, I'd like to get back into comedy. She went, have you not got enough going on? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I said, I would like to maybe start a charity night and start, so, so I started a charity night for cancer research. Yeah. And she went, ah, all right. And we, we thought it wouldn't really pan out. Thought it wouldn't really pan out. So I managed to find a, a bar in Glasgow City Centre called Iron Horse Bar where my dad and I used to go drinking. Yeah, that's where my brother had his, uh, uh, his engagement party. All oh, right, okay. No, I love the Iron Horse. Yeah. I used to go drinking there. I used to go drinking there with my dad. So I thought that was a good place. They've got yeah. a kind of downstairs bar. Uh, uh, yeah, they've yeah, obviously got the ground floor and they've got the upstairs function. But so we went down and they said, we don't think it's a really good room for comedy. I decided to give it a go in. Anyway, we did the usual thing where first month, Loads of my pals came along and we had a bit of a laugh sort of thing. And then month two, nobody really turned up. Mm -hmm. So we got some comedians and nobody really turned up. And then month three, it was just as bad. And then we decided we were just kind of probably going to wind it down. So yeah. we, we lasted three months. I was emceeing, which I'd never done before. So that was quite exciting. And now it's one of my favourite things to do as emceeing. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, so we thought we'll wind it down and we decided. And one of the comedians that came along was uh, a comedian called John Purvis. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's uh, well, he was a minister. He's now retired. Mm. But he also runs a charity called 3D Drum Chapel. He doesn't run it. He's, he's on the board yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and he asked if we could do a charity night for 3D Drum Chapel. And I decided to make that the last charity comedy night. Yeah. And then, un unfortunately, uh, the Clutha happened. Oof. So the Clutha happened. And then uh, John contacted me and said, actually, why don't you make it for the Clutha? Yeah. Uh, and, and it was in the December. So yeah. we decided to do that. We did it for the Clutha. And then I said, well, I need to, I need to do John's gig now. And to do John's gig, we decided not to do anything in January and we went back in February. Mm. And I don't know why, went back in February and we were almost having to knock people back at the door. Wow. So suddenly something changed and there were loads of people there. Just get generally excited. It was a kind of Thursday night. It was, it was the first Thursday of the month. We decided to do that because it was close after most people's payday sort of thing. Yeah. And suddenly it was down. Feast or famine for seven years after that. It was either a full room. Sometimes we even had to move upstairs because it got so big. Yeah. Started doing other stuff like me and my pal Graham Stewart started doing a thing called Little Afternoon on a Saturday afternoon yeah. about once a quarter. And it had loads of kind of spin-offs and stuff. Suddenly loads of people were coming to me looking for gigs rather than me having to like contact people. Yeah. And it was just an exciting seven years and we kept going until the, the Iron Horse shut down just before yeah. COVID and um, got a lot of great feedback from people and a lot of people still said it was one of their favourite gigs to do which is quite humbling yeah. and I don't even understand why uh, they would say that and I kind of fact there's lots of great gigs out in Glasgow uh, but it was quite humbling and I stuck with it through thick or thin you know my, yeah. my dad got better then my dad got ill and then my dad died and then you know certain things and then I had a heart attack which was fun as well oh, so yeah. that, was the, that, that was the only two times that I missed 
the 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 gig. Oh, your dad uh, my dad, happen. my dad, my dad died, and the gig was supposed to be the next day. Uh, and I still went, by the way, but I got somebody else to MC and ended up doing a 10 minute set about my dad. Wow. But uh, I missed the heart attack one. Yeah, but, um, that would, I would be quite surprised I'm if you were just like, I've had a heart attack, but I'll still be I'll there. I'll still be there, absolutely. So, so, so I missed that one. That was, that was good fun. But, it could have been better. It could have been that you had the heart attack on stage. That would have been amazing. I have died then on stage would, a couple of times. Have had a clue if it was actually part of the act or not. I, I have actually made the joke that if I do fall over, because there, there's this kind of thing in comedy sometimes where you know you hear about like you you hear about like Tommy Cooper dying yeah. on stage and people kind of laughing and going, "This is hilarious for twenty minutes." And I'm thinking, you know, I don't care how good you are. You can't die in front of people and still make it funny for twenty minutes. Something might be wrong here. Yeah. Uh, and so it's happened a couple of times because it's happened to another comedian, Ian Cognito. So there was definitely there was definitely a point where people were dropping dead on stage. Yeah. And I did do a disclaimer briefly afterwards, going, "If I do fall over, it's not part of it. I need help." Yeah. Uh, you know, like I've had, I've had a heart attack. Like this could be serious. Yeah, no, it's like just just watch out sort of thing. But uh, you know, it's really niche. That's Edinburgh Fringe type stuff. If you could do <laughs> if you could do a kind of hour long show about lying dead in yeah, front of people, well, it just drops dead. Like, oh, <laughs> just, five stars, The Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's coming up next for you? Like we were talking about, like your own fringe and stuff like that. Have you got any gigs lined up? Do you know what? I, I'm I'm going I'm going to the fringe obviously a couple of times, and I'm going to try and line up doing a couple of gigs for other people while I'm while I'm there. Um, I had some plans pre-COVID that kind of obviously fell through because of COVID and I'm, I have just haven't really got my act together again. I, I, I still keep thinking that something's going to happen and and it's, it's, you know, we're suddenly not going to have a fringe or whatever. I nearly didn't do the Glasgow Comedy Festival for the same reason. I thought something's going to happen. Because, yeah. you know, I, Glasgow Comedy Festival 2020 mm. lasted three days, really. Yeah. And then it all, all started cancelling. I probably did about 80% of the gigs and the Glasgow Comedy Festival because I did all yeah. the gigs kind of at the beginning and then you I was going to put that in like you say like you did 80% yep. of the gigs you just put in brackets 2020 2020 <laughs> I was like 80% appeared in 80% of Glasgow Comedy Festival 2020 <laughs> uh, so yeah so I'm, I'm I'm going over to enjoy it as a punter and I'm going yeah. to try and get on to a couple of gigs while I'm there so I'll just try and kind of marry it up yeah so what else have you got uh, lined up like for performing wise Still, still, obviously, trying to do online stuff like the Friday six PM show, and the reason the reason for that is it's you know, COVID opened up a lot of kind of possibilities yeah. that suddenly you can be gigging with people you'd never have a chance of gigging with uh, yeah. just because of geographical locale sort of thing. Yeah. So, so that that was that was quite good, you know, because you know I never dreamed of gigging with people from from Edinburgh until <laughs> uh, until COVID kicked in. But you know, you know, suddenly I was like getting up at four in the morning doing gigs in the States and stuff. Yeah. You know, it was just a mental time. So so I'm quite keen to also the good thing about gigging online is the fact that you know I can be doing a gig at like eight PM yeah. uh, on a Thursday evening and then be sitting in front of the, the telly at nine o'clock going, What's on? What you know, Aye. just yeah, can I can right. put the kids to bed. It's quite quite Aye. exciting. That's something like uh, because a lot of a lot of comedians like are you know, like either single or what they put grown up kids yeah. or whatever like but when you when you're trying to do something like that and you've got young ones, like, yeah. you've still got like a routine. You still want to be there. As yeah. A dad, you want to do their bedtime routine. You want to make sure that they're bed warm, all that kind of stuff. And then you're thinking, fuck, like they're down. Well, my kid's the case. They're down like quarter past eight. And I'm like, yeah, I've got to get ready, head into town, do a gig. Yeah. Probably half ten. Back up the road. Well, yeah, after the drill fades off, it's probably about midnight, and I'm already three hours over my bedtime. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, usually if I if I'm gigging and it it's a good gig, mm. uh, there's a good chance I really won't sleep that night. Yeah, you because know, uh, even now, you know, having done this for quite a while, I still get a total buzz. Yeah. For, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you you you'd think you become desensitised to it, but I just kind of yeah. just dead excited. Uh just happy about the house mostly, but uh, you know, but so you do do that. So I'm, um, you know, I'm still doing online stuff. I'm doing a few gigs like kind of Aberdeen for Jamie Tate, like Rock Hopper, oh, yeah. nice. a comedy. They're 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 always good fun. They're just brilliant laugh more yeah. than anything else. It's just exciting, you know, just oh, to man, just to good. travel up as well and then yeah. sleep outside the McDonald's at two in the morning on the way home. <laughs> it's just 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 excellent. But she she just runs a a great gig. Yeah, I've done. Uh, I've not got anything planned with Charlie Wallace, etc. Who does. Uh, his gig up in Dundee. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 
again previously a lot of the best gigs that I've done since lockdown kind of ended has been outside Glasgow which is really weird when I'm talking about the fact that I like to be uh, gigging from home so that I can be there for the kids and then it's like you know it's two extremes uh, either that or I'm driving up to Perth yeah, it's, uh, like, it's like I'll either stay on Zoom or let them off off the other end. Exactly, of the I'll see them aura. Yeah, uh, yeah, and a lot of these sometimes are in school nights, so I'm like yeah. getting home at like four in the morning, and then I'm up at six for work and oh, crazy man. times. That's, that is nuts, man. Right, so tell my followers where can they find you on all the, the social things for checking out? Like, so, well, I, I'm I'm the worst that can I advertise myself, and obviously, you know, on Twitch there's a Friday six pm show, which is just. Twitch TV Friday 6 p.m. show. Uh my my personal Twitch account is the I mean, I don't know how I came up with this name for my Twitch account, but my, my Twitch account for, for my streaming is John Carruthers. That's, that's, I know. Uh, that's really, really absolutely. Uh obviously I'm on I don't have a John Carruthers comedian page, which I, I should have. Uh, I, I used to have one for the charity comedy night and then I got barred from Facebook and suddenly I'm not the administrator for it anymore so I'm not hey, the administrator right. but that was, that, that was just called charity comedy night obviously I've got my personal Facebook page which I'm more than happy for people to kind of add me on Facebook that's John Carruthers my my Twitter one I really wasn't look, you know I wasn't I wasn't thinking when I came up with my Twitter name I yeah. just I, I, I did this kind of arsehole trying to be funny type thing yeah. with my Twitter name which is kind of bitten me a wee bit uh in the arse and uh, my, my my twitter name is the the words my name backwards backwards just <laughs> s-d-r-a-w okay and i just thought that's brilliant nobody's ever come up with that before or have they oh they haven't excellent mm-hmm. i'll do that and now when people say oh what we're we going to do for your social media and you you see it flash up on screen john zoom guys are going well i'm not going to get any more followers <laughs> from that kind of going s-d-r-a uh so yeah. But if you just if you just search for John Colors on Twitter as well, yeah. uh, you'll probably find me there. So I was just I was waiting for the like the the size there where you go. Like, I, there was a really bad, there was a really neat one, and I came up with it, and it was John Carruthers. John Carruthers. There <laughs> already was a John Carruthers, or I've done. Most people would have maybe written John Carruthers by words, but yeah. I was just being you know I doubled down on our yeah. foolishness. Go back or go home. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And I wrote, probably done it from home. I did do it from yes. home, absolutely. Uh, and again, you know, uh, I, I don't update Twitter anywhere near as much as I should. And I count the fact that nobody can ever find me. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I'm, as you've probably seen, you know, I'm constantly posting on Facebook mm-hmm. and it's just basically shite. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's Facebook, honestly. Yeah, I know, absolutely. So well, it's, just, just post shite and then well, be surprised if anybody actually looks at it. Yeah. <laughs> so we are starting to count on time. So I'll ask no you worries. the last question that I ask all my guests. If you could give one piece of advice to anybody struggling with mental health issues at this point in time, what would that piece of advice be and why? Definitely it would be seek help. And it's not necessarily seek help from someone you know, which I think sometimes can be the worst thing because they can't see the wood for the trees. Uh, Can I tell you about personal experience? Of course. Uh, I've got lots of kind of mental health stories. There was one time when I left work in Glasgow City Centre and I was walking home and I walked past a bridge mm. and decided that's how I'd do it. Right. And then I just spent the whole time kind of walking. You know, I didn't walk and kind of peer down, but I just went, that's how I'll do it. And I walked home the entire way, past about another four bridges, mm. absolutely terrified that it just came into my mind. Mm-hmm. And it was just that quick. And, you know, yeah. n- never a real kind of conscious desire to do it, but it was there yeah. and I was suddenly kind of going I mean if you caught me if you caught me just in the wrong frame of mind half an hour later I could have that so I went home I went home and I just said to my wife absolutely terrified this just happened mm-hmm. uh, and she said you need to speak to somebody and it can't be me because I'd have pushed you no I was, so so she so she 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 just said you need you need to phone a doctor you need to do something and she convinced me to phone the Samaritans yeah uh, which other other uh, avenues of help are there? And then I just phoned the Samaritans and spoke to somebody that I don't know mm-hmm. about stuff that I couldn't say to people that I did know. Yeah, definitely. Don't don't live in your own head. Don't 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 do what if or do, and and try and. Just, there's no real kind of right answer to this, as you probably know, which is why you ask it. Yeah. If you're in a situation where your mental health has been affected that fundamentally, 
how can you be expected to help yourself? You need somebody else yeah. to, to, it doesn't even need to be somebody that knows you, but it needs to be somebody that potentially knows what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And imagine that the person that I spoke to that day knew what I was going through and that was why they did what they did. Yeah. Because they, they've got a hands-on experience either themselves or with someone that they loved yeah. where they either needed somebody to be there or they needed to be there for somebody and it's had a fundamental impact in their life. And you can't, you, and definitely in terms of mental health, it's like a broken leg. You wouldn't try and fix a broken leg yourself. Yeah. You would seek some sort of medical help. You wouldn't just say, do you know what, it'll be absolutely fine. Why does it smell of almonds six weeks later? Yeah. You know, you just, you, you, if your mental health is at such a low point that you're thinking about stuff like that, even if it's not something you would even, you know, consider, consider consciously doing. I mean, I'm sure there's loads of people that have ended their life that didn't consciously consider doing it till they consciously decided to do it. And then it was so far gone. You can't be expected to help yourself in situations like that. And you also shouldn't feel bad that you can't help yourself because uh, it takes, it takes a, an inner strength, I think, to be able to find help yeah. and you shouldn't, you can't solve everything yourself. Definitely, man. So, yeah. No, that's really good advice. Okay. But, but, and it's why I like asking people that aren't like, you know, doctors or mm. quote unquote professionals because what, you need to hear the advice of people who have been through, yeah. like, who've, like, who've walked the mile in the shoes, so yeah. to speak. Because like, they're normally the ones that are like, well, this is what worked for me. So if it works for me, it could work for you. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the gist of it. And that's why when I say to people where they go, oh, what do you know? And I'm like, I live with this on a daily fucking basis. Yes. And it's like, it takes all my strength not to throw myself off a bridge every yeah. day. Yeah. Well, but I do it. Yeah. Because I, I feel like I need to. It's like they say to me, oh, you're so natural being on here. Like, I'm fucking terrified coming on here and mm-hmm. talking about like my own stories and things like that. But I do it because I feel like I have to. I feel that that's what I need to do. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I think, again, you know, we, we, we didn't really, I could, you know, I could do another. 50 of these and probably not get to the bottom of uh all of my all of my kind of issues uh, i don't even think i got near scraping the surface because i started talking about my kids what a waste of time that was oh, uh but, kids, but don't they suck? i don't i don't think people realize how therapeutic standing up on a stage and talking about stuff can be obviously some people take it too far and you go actually you genuinely do need a therapist yeah. maybe consider that but i think it's it, sometimes it, it, it's very therapeutic mm-hmm. to go up there and some people go up there and they be someone else yeah. Even for a while, or people go out there and they can air what's going on in their brain in a way that can be entertaining mm-hmm. and also give them a bit of insight that they might not necessarily have had if they just sat in their own thoughts yeah. and done a thing. And I, I think we all know lots of comedians that, that, that just sit there and they look like rabbits in the headlights and then they're completely different people and they're standing in front of a microphone. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, man. John, it's been a pleasure it's, having you on. It's been a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I loved it, man. Like, but I wish you nothing but success. Like, yeah, keep me updated on the when the gigs front. I will do. Like, I will do. Like, and with John's consent, links will be in the descriptions below for any anybody that wants to follow him or check him out. Excellent. Thank you. So until next time, my faithful followers, I've been Andrew Dernan. This has been the brilliant John Carruthers. Like, check him out. Thank like, you. And as I always say, it's one funny motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Like, so right back next, at you. So until next time, take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.